Sophia. Uh, our topic for today is interface relation, the Abraham Accords and the future of the Middle East. This discussion is a timely and crucial one, given the changes that are shaping the social political landscape of the Middle East and the world at large. The Abraham Accord, signed in 2020, represents a historic breakthrough in the relation between Israel and the Arab nations. It is more than a peace treaty, it is a testament to the possibilities of change and progress when we focus on our shared humanity, mutual respect and understanding. Imam Tawidi, with a deep knowledge and commitment to interface dialogue, is well suited to help us navigate this complex topic. I'm very pleased to introduce him today. He will bring a unique perspective to this discussion and will share his insight on the impact of the Abraham Accords on interface relation, regional stability and the prospects for lasting peace. Imam Mohammed Tawidi is an Islamic scholar, educator, and current vice president of the Global Imams Council. He has dedicated his life to ideologically tackling the spread of Islamic extremism and has delivered speeches at conferences, parliament, mosques, Islamic centers, churches, synagogues, temples, etc., across the Middle East, Europe, Asia, America, and Australia. He is licensed by Islamic leaders of the highest order to lead and represent the Muslim community. Mohammed Saoudi enjoys healthy international diplomatic relationships with numerous governments and provides regular advice on counterterrorism. Imam Saoudi was publicly ordered um, as an Islamic authority, uh, and, uh, sorry, as an Islamic authority in the holy city of Qum in Iran by the senior Grand Ayatollah Shirazi in 20, uh, in, um, in 2020. My first uh, question, dear Eman Tawidi, uh, will be more global. I want to get your perspective on the significance of the Abraham Accords in promoting peace and stability in the Middle East. Have you noticed some change uh, on the ground in three years? And um, how do you believe it has impacted interface, di interface dialogue and cooperation? Sarah, thank you very much for that. Uh, to all my friends, thank you very much for having me. It's an absolute pleasure to be here, part of Elnet's uh, distance uh, online programs. I had the pleasure of being in uh, Elnet's uh, International Policy Conference uh, in May, the first week of May. Thank you very much for having me again. I just want to clarify, I was ordained in 2010 in the Holy yes, City, I'm sorry. Oh, not in 2020. So it's been over. Yes, yes, I'm sorry. Um, I uh, would like to begin by being very uh, open about the reality on the ground. The Abraham Accords has changed the face of not only the region, but also the religion, in the sense that many people, uh, at least on a personal level, when I would uh, visit the European countries or the United States of America, meeting with people from all, all over the spectrum, whether it be on, on the diplomatic level, political, social, cultural levels. Uh, you meet with those faith leaders and it appears as though there, there was no hope for the region or that there was no hope for the religion to ever enter into a peace agreement with specifically the Jewish people and for Arab states to accept the fact that Israel is a reality, it's a country that is acknowledged by the United Nations, the same country, uh, sorry, the same United Nations that uh, acknowledges the existence of Pakistan that, was, uh, that, that received its independence uh, within the same time as the founding of the modern state of Israel. Therefore, when you have a United Nations that approves of Muslim states, this authority also recognizes Israel, uh, I think, uh, no longer wishing to live in reality and live in your own bubble uh, has brought uh, great detriment to the region, has made uh, the Muslim states appear backwards uh, for nearly seven decades and has tarnished the reputation of the religion, always associating it with with violence and conflict and headaches and never ending wars. And it also allowed the extremists, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, the regime occupying Iran, uh, we need to be very clear, it's not an Iranian regime, it is a regime currently in Iran, 
occupying Iran. Uh, no way is it uh, accepted by the majority of the people. Uh, but uh, Hamas and the Muslim Brotherhood funded by Qatar and so on, they've become the voice of the religion and region basically off of a conflict that has nothing to do with the region or the religion. Uh, so, and we can get into that later on, but the Abraham Accords has changed the face of the region for the better. It is moving rapidly in the sense that yes, diplomatic um, agreements for, for the signatories on, on, onto the Abraham Accords have somewhat stopped. Uh, the countries that wanted to sign on have signed on. We are waiting for uh, other countries to, to hopefully uh, join. Um, one of them being Saudi Arabia, which I was in in January uh, 5th of this year. Uh, we were received by the Muslim World League and uh, many discussions about peace continue uh, to take place much more than one had expected, which is always a good thing. Uh, but uh, even though the, uh, and by the way, the diplomatic uh, expansion has sort of taken a pause, uh, that's largely because there was a government change in Israel. When uh, Netanyahu was in office, him and the Trump administration managed to make some success uh, in, in whether or not countries were joining onto the uh, Abraham Accords but they were congratulating the Abraham Accords. They were defending it, even though they did not join it, such as Oman, the Sultanate of Oman, did not join, but it defended the UAE's decision and it defended Bahrain. And Saudi Arabia, um, the father of the current uh, um, Saudi ambassador to Washington, D.C., who, who he himself is the former ambassador to Washington, D.C., uh, Bandar bin Sultan, uh, His Highness uh, Al-Amir Bandar bin Sultan, came out with a three-part series on Al Arabiya TV defending the Arab, the Gulf decision to enter the Abraham Accords and, and basically head in this direction. The pause happened because of a change of government in uh, Israel. Uh, you find with uh, um, Naftali and uh, Yair Lapid and uh, Mansour Abbas, this coalition was not well received by the Arab states uh, because uh, of, of its uh, instability. The fact that these discussions require lengthy time and the, the coalition, coalition sort of agreed that Naftali would, would be in office for two years, then Yair. And so there wasn't stability at all. And Mansour Abbas is not a favorite in the Gulf uh, because of his instability within his, his own uh, party and his own uh, position in, in Israel. And of course, his, uh, his willingness to be uh, pragmatic and have dialogue with everyone, including the Muslim Brotherhood, did not allow for the Arab states to say, okay, let's all join. But now that Netanyahu is back um, and that this government is there, it looks like um, the speed that things would, would take place uh, a bit more rapidly. Um, but uh, ultimately we are looking at a Abraham Accords that is uh, not only regional, but also global, because these countries that have signed onto the Abraham Accords have citizens in Canada, they have citizens in France, they have citizens in America, they have citizens all over the place, Australia, New Zealand. And when their countries have taken on this and when their societies have taken on this role of peace and coexistence with Jews and, and others, um, it becomes easier for us to achieve social change and social reform, keeping in mind that this change and this reform happened without any violations to Islamic law, meaning that the UAE did not change the Holy Quran in order to achieve peace with the Jews in Israel. The UAE did not ban any, any type of, of, of books or clerics or whatsoever. This was a social reform. It happened uh, because the, the timing was right. And this is what we stress on, that the timing is right. I hope I answered your question, Sarah. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I noticed that you're very confident in the fact that Saudi Arabia should uh, join the agreement at last, uh, maybe in a few years, I don't know. Um, how do you explain uh, the Palestinian abstination uh, reluctancy, sorry, uh, to join these agreements. I mean, on the ground, you 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 give some uh, you know uh, you give some reflection on uh, Abbas, but uh, I mean more on the ground. Do you think that people, Palestinian people, are willing uh, and more open to to join the Abraham Accords? No. Uh, firstly, we need to discuss the Palestinian issue. Again, time is limited, so we have to be brief but we need to discuss it with truth. 
and with openness and with facts, not with emotions and whataboutism. There's a reality here. The Palestinian people have been saying that the Abraham Accords and by Palestinian people, I mean the Palestinian leaders and their supporters. They've been saying that the Abraham Accords is a betrayal to the Islamic cause uh, related to Al-Aqsa Mosque and the betrayal to the Arab cause of liberating Arab lands from Jewish uh, so-called occupation. The fact is the Palestinians are not Arabs and the cause is not an Arabic cause. Arabia begins from the Gulf of Arabia, which you look at the Arabian Peninsula, at the very bottom you have Oman and Yemen, and moving up you have the UAE and Saudi Arabia, and all the way up to the Jordan River, that is Arabian land. On the other side of the Jordan River, that is Judea, and Judea goes all the way up to the Golan and even into Syria, and comes all the way down to Sinai, which means it enters the no northern part of Egypt. That is Judea. That is the Judea we know in our Islamic scriptures. That is what is referred to as the land of Moses and David and Daniel and Solomon and the land of the Torah. And these are the Jewish people that even during the early years of Islam, these are the people that we had dialogue with and we traded with and they came over uh, to Arabia and they established their tribes, 12 Jewish tribes in Arabia, Beni Qurayza, Beni Qaynu all of these uh, Jewish tribes that were in, in the region, Khaybar, for example, it's, it's known for its events. Uh, so this region is what we know, and its people we know is Judea, and its people are Jewish people. This is where our prophets came from. Uh, and uh, the Palestinians are not Arabs. The Palestinians descend from many lineages, from the lineages of the, the occupants of, of these lands. The Romans, the Circassians, the Gypsies, the Turks, the Armenians, um, the uh, uh, other other nations that came and went, the, the Ottomans. Uh, these are the leftover groups of people, and uh, they they are known as the Palestinians, even though the name is problematic because Philistin means invader. Um, they've been chosen to call themselves that, and that's fine. But they're not Arabs, which means the cause is not an Arabic cause. If there is a Palestinian who claims he's Arab, then he's indigenous to Arabia on the other side of the Jordan River, and they cannot be indigenous to Judea. Arabs cannot be indigenous to Judea, and Judeans cannot be indigenous to Arab land. Each of us have our own land. We are neighbors bordered by what is now known as the River of Jordan. Therefore, this reality uh, supports the, the argument that it's also not an Islamic cause because Islam is not under threat. Jews have not targeted Islam. Uh, Judaism doesn't have a, a teaching that Islam needs to be annihilated or wiped out, or Muslims for that matter. 20% of, of uh, Israel's population are Muslims. There are, uh, I mean, we're looking at dozens and dozens of mosques, 400 imams, um, all of them enjoy freedoms in, uh, in, in Israel. Uh, and again, these are Muslims with Israeli passports, which mean they can easily move to many countries in the West and, and have many opportunities there, um, except that they choose to stay. And it's disgusting that these Muslims are ignored by the majority of the Muslim world because they're the Muslims of Israel. And that's wrong. These are Muslims, they are brothers in faith. The cause is not Islamic cause um, because, uh, again, there is no Muslim consensus. There is no Muslim agreement that the Al-Aqsa Mosque is in Jerusalem. There is a mosque in Jerusalem called Al-Aqsa Mosque, but whether or not it is the mosque referred to in the Holy Quran is a whole new debate because when the verse came down uh, in the Holy Quran referring to Al-Aqsa Mosque, um, the, the mosque in Jerusalem did not exist. The mosque in Jerusalem, Al-Aqsa, did not exist during the time of the Prophet, did not exist during the time of the first caliph, did not exist during the time of the second caliph or the third caliph. The second caliph established the foundations for that mosque but then the Umayyads, Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, the fifth of the Umayyad dynasty, came and he established that mosque uh, in 705. So we're looking at 72, 73 years after the death of the Prophet Muhammad. So that Jerusalem mosque was never visited by the Prophet Muhammad or any, any one of his companions. This came back seven decades uh, later on. So there's a big argument as to whether the name Al-Aqsa, the farthest mosque, 
actually means a mosque in the heavens uh, and whether it's a mosque on earth. I mean, there are debates, there are claims that Al-Aqsa Mosque is in Saudi Arabia, uh, uh, 20 meters, uh, sorry, 20 kilometers north of uh, Mecca, uh, because uh, we have uh, one of the main uh, historians of biographers of the Prophet Muhammad's life who says that the Prophet Muhammad prayed in Al-Aqsa Mosque in the morning and then prayed in Mecca in the evening. And if you look at the distance, it's, it's sort of impossible uh, to move from Jerusalem to Mecca, you know, in one day at that time, it makes a lot of sense if it's 20 kilometers away. So these are arguments which we're not really agreed upon. Therefore, the Palestinians have a serious predicament. They need to uh, figure out what they want to do. They've been offered a state five times, and they have rejected it more than five times. And the fact is, and again, I say we need to stick with facts. The fact is the Palestinians already have three states. Because if you look at geopolitics, what makes a state? What is a state? I mean, what do you need in order to establish a state? You need a head of state, you need a military, and you need an economy. So these are the two wings, including the head of state, that make a state. Ministry of uh, Interior and uh, Intelligence and Media and Sports and Culture. and These are extra. What makes a state is a head of state and an economy, right? Some countries don't even need a military. They have alliances like NATO in, in today's day and age, right? Like Switzerland, for example, don't even need a military. But the, the main foundations of, of a state is a head of state and an economy. They, the Palestinians have that in Gaza. The Palestinians have that in the West Bank. And guess what? The majority of Arabs in Jordan are of Palestinian descent. The king of Jordan is Saudi Arabian, right? He's not of a Jordanian descent. He's Saudi Arabian. He's a descendant of the, of the Prophet Muhammad. He's indigenous to Arabia. Um, and uh, Jordan was, was created for that very uh, reason, to make way for the house of Al-Saud uh, to be present in, in the country of Mecca and Medina. And therefore, the kingdom of Jordan was established as a compensation, as a relocation for the kings that ruled the region, and they were the family of the Hashemite kingdom. Now, the Palestinians today in Jordan, they're the majority, uh, and they have, uh, you know, everything they need there. They have economy, military, even more, and the Palestinians. The idea that a Palestinian remains a refugee even after receiving American citizenship and three, third, fourth generation all remain refugees, that is, uh, it's, it's not realistic. Uh, and, and it's not something that can, it's not an argument that can be respected. Uh, therefore, they uh, they might want to join the Abraham Accords. They might be Palestinians against Hamas and Palestinians against the regime's interference in the region. But ultimately, it is the corrupt rulers of the Palestinian Authority, the corrupt rulers that are governing Gaza, the corrupt rulers living outside of uh, this conflict, uh, enjoying a lavish lifestyle in, um, in Qatar and in Iran. So the, the real uh, decision is with the Palestinians themselves, if they want to continue on this path or not. The Arabs, I guarantee you, the Arabs will not sit by and just let the Palestinians take their time by holding the Arab future hostage that the success of the economy and the developments and the reform that's happening in Arabia, there's a, there's a limit. You know, we have young leaders coming into the region. At one point, they're going to say, listen, this problem was dealt with by our grandfathers and our fathers. We are not going to engage in this. And we see that the first step was the Abraham Accords. Slowly but surely, you're going to have military alliances. You're going to have serious amount of trade. It all depends on the United States of America's attitude towards the Gulf. Because if you're going to be pushing Saudi Arabia towards Iran and Russia, you're going to weak, slow down the Abraham Accords. Uh, that, that's a given, right? That, that is a given. But if you continue to maintain good relations with them, uh, there are many factors. Uh, we, we don't need to get into all of the many factors here involved, but ultimately the Arabs will be more patient with the, uh, with the Palestinians, but there will come a time where they will say, listen, we've given you a lot. We fought for you. We've done everything. We fed you. We've supported you. We've defended you. We've lost lives for you. We've done everything we can for you. But you guys want to stay the way you are, meaning the leaders, that is your problem. We will move on with the rest of the world. AI technology and, you know, the, the transformation, the rapid transformation of our uh, world will not allow the visionary leaders in the Middle East to continue uh, 
uh, you know, with, with this baggage that is a headache. Yes. Just uh, before my next question, I'd like to invite the audience to leave their uh, question in the chat box and we will ask them after. Um, Imam Tawidi, you are one of the main voices advocating for the reform of Islam. Um, do you think that the, the Abraham Accord could help spread a more modern vision? Um, uh, I think there's been a, uh, a popular misunderstanding that I want to reform uh, Islam. Islam cannot be reformed. Islam cannot be reformed because Muslims we believe in only what comes from God. And any type of reformed mm. Islam would be a man-made religion. Uh, so uh, the Islamic reformation is a delusion. It's not real. It will not happen. You can uh, present a, a reformed Quran. Who's going to follow it? 20, 30 people? No, I'm not an Islamic reformer. I'm a social reformer of Muslim societies. I don't believe religion can be reformed. I believe that a reformed group can have their own ideology, but the religion as a whole, um, changing Islam in Saudi Arabia, no, that, that's not, never gonna happen. Um, and as many attempts have happened by powerful people, wealthy uh, rulers, it will not happen. Um, what will happen is a social reform, and that is very successful, and that is real. So in the UAE, as I said, they did not ban any Islamic scripture, they did not change any Islamic scripture, they did not change the Holy Quran, they did not change anything religious, religion wise, but you find that, that society was reformed and society reached a point in awareness and education and stability and trust in uh, their ruler's decision and they accepted peace with Israel and you find that they are even more into peace with Israel than the Israelis are <laughs> into peace with the Arabs. The romance in the UAE, the diplomatic romance and the brotherhood is on a different level um, and the hospitality and so on. So Bahrain the same, Morocco also. You look at these countries, none of them have changed the religion at all, at all. A society changes. So I believe I'm a social reformist. Uh, and you also take a look at the Abraham Accords contribution to the social reform. Definitely, Sarah, definitely. Because when, when the Abraham Accords was being discussed, the majority of, of its critics were saying, this is going to fail. It's never going to happen. Mm -hmm. There is nothing good that's going to come out of this. When the uh, nations and the states saw this uh, uh, success and they saw how healthy it is for society and how peace is possible and peace is real and it's necessary and this is what the God of Abraham wants, for Muslims and Jews and others living in the region. Um, you find that not only does it uh, assist in the expansion of the Abraham Accords, it assists in changing the awareness of the states that are yet to join the Abraham Accords. And that is necessary because timing is everything. A state cannot join the Abraham Accords when its people are not yet ready. And the success in, in these Gulf states with the Abraham Accords being projected onto social media, projected onto the world, uh, is showing the, the citizens of those nations that this is what you guys can get as well. It makes it attractive, it makes it acceptable, it makes it something worthy of striving for. And so, yes, I agree that it will. What, what step, um, according to you, could be taken to enhance people to people exchanges and cultural understanding between the nation involved? The first step is respecting each other's timings. Uh, and this is what's happening with Saudi Arabia. Um, when the Arabs uh, say the timing is not right, trust them. The timing needs to be perfect. So the first step is understanding the timing of your counterpart, because if you're working towards peace and activities and delegations and visits and tours, and they're not ready, then uh, you're gonna hit a dead end. You don't want a dead end, you want uh, to make sure that the timing is right so the achievements you put forward and the efforts you put forward will have a fruitful result. Uh, therefore, number one is timing. Secondly, what we really need to do is people-to-people -people connections. There needs to be, needs to be delegations um, in countries that have already achieved the Abraham Accords. Israel and UAE have peace right now. So I think the impact of visiting each other government arranged uh, events is good, but it's not 
um, needed anymore. You're already at peace. What needs to happen is these two countries need to bring people from other countries that are, that are yet to sign on to the Abraham Accords and invite them to the UAE so they can see a Muslim country at peace with the Jews in real life. That would have a greater effect, greater impact. And I also believe uh, visits to Auschwitz, to uh, Holocaust uh, uh, um, um, uh, uh, museums, and also visits to camps for the re-education of people so that they know what the Jewish people have gone through. So that this idea, this conspiracy, this false idea that Jews want to occupy any land they get, uh, that uh, begins to uh, um, uh, dissolve and, and they begin to see the, the, the falsehood in that. So I think there are many steps. One of them is education. The other is people to people connection. Thank you. Uh, we have several uh, questions from our audience. Um, first of all, um, with the current movement brewing in Iran, many Iranians wrongly or otherwise blame Islam for all that has gone wrong in Iran with all the killings. What message will do, would you send to the clergy currently ruling Iran? No message to them. We don't speak to terrorists. Um, we, don't, we don't have dialogue with terrorists. I am absolutely against any dialogue with the extremist terrorists, uh, the Taliban, the Hamas, the Muslim Brotherhood, the regime in Iran, they're all uh, the same Islamist extremist terrorists with a different flavor, different flavors, Sunni flavor, Shia flavor, but they're all um, on, on that same page. And I am absolutely against any dialogue with them. And I think that it is a waste, the Biden administration discussing anything nuclear related with Iran is a waste uh, of time and energy and of honor. Uh, we do not discuss anything with the regime. We don't send them any, any messages because they are not a legitimate regime representing the people. It is a group of absolute terrorists who will use the West and use every opportunity to continue ensuring that they remain in power and therefore they need to be uh, removed out of power um, you know, at any given chance. So zero dialogue with the regime. When it comes to um, the uprising and the people's claims, yes, you have to believe those people because if, if they're 20 years old and 25 years old and 30 years old, they haven't seen anything other than the Islam presented to them by the mullahs. They haven't seen anything other than terrorism. They haven't seen anything other than war and threats and the streets are named after terrorists. I mean, you know, you go to France, you go to the European countries and the streets are named after good people. The, a road is named after uh, an important lawyer, an important mayor, an important artist, a poet. You go to uh, the Iran and look at the street names, martyr so-and-so, martyr so-and-so. Everyone's a martyr. You have like, you know, 20,000 terrorists in one city. All of them have names, uh, streets named after them. That atmosphere destroys the, the, the passion and the self-esteem and the ability of the Iranian people. The Iranian people, you know, they have everything to contribute to this world. They are one of the most successful communities outside of Iran. The art, the music, the, the education, the scientific contributions uh, that the Iranians can come up with, it is fascinating and really in some areas unmatched. Um, and then you have this uh, cult of extremist clerics, crooked, corrupt clerics who have suppressed Iranian women, suppressed um, um, the Iranian people. And they say it's Islam. It's not Islam. It's political Islam. There's a huge difference between Islam and Islamism. Islam is the mainstream religion of the people. And they are the same Muslims who are opposing the regime. The majority of the people opposing the regime in Iran, when they hear, they hear the call, call to prayer, they go and pray. They fast Ramadan. They are Muslims, but they're against a Islamist dictatorship. Islamist is using, uh, Islamism is using the religion or any religion, any message of God, anything sacred to further their own political agenda. That is Islamism. And they are the terrorists, they're the extremists, they blow, they kill, they behead, they hang, they shoot, they stone. 
they are nothing representative of God whatsoever. Do you think Iran is a lost cause? I mean, how how could what what could make things change there? I mean, okay, Iran is not a lost cause. <laughs> Iran is a if in fact if we if if we have any hope really with any uh, country uh, gaining its freedom, it is the Iranian people. Uh, definitely not a lost cause. That is a country with will, a country with with uh, a phenomenal history uh, going back over a millennia. And this is a country that has seen many changes and many uh, partitions and many developments. Uh, Iran is not a country that you give up on at all. Um, and how we support them is very easy. Stop strengthening the regime in Iran. That's the first step. Stop inviting them to the United Nations. The regime now chairs a committee for women's rights. And they just held an exhibition in the United Nations about women's fashion clothes. You're killing me? You're kidding me? You don't, you don't allow the, the women to dress uh, in fashion in Tehran and you come to the United Nations and you host an exhibition of women's clothing? What world are we living in where this makes sense? So no, I think the first step really is strengthening the, the Iranian people by weakening the regime and you weaken the regime by cornering them, by cornering them, by isolating them. And if you were to take a look at North Korea, for example, North Korea is totally isolated. The regime is not totally isolated. The regime in Iran is not totally isolated. There is still dialogue, visits, diplomatic relations. That's not how you support the Iranian people. If you really support the Iranian people, and if you are really against theocracy, then the Western world and democracies need to take a firm stance against the regime in Iran totally, deport its ambassadors, recall your ambassadors. There needs to be zero dialogue with them, zero trade, zero alliances. They need to be crippled to the ground. That is how the people will rise without weapons, without weapons. The people will rise, walk into uh, the uh, government buildings and reclaim their country. As simple as that. The Iranian people are not afraid of guns or, or anything like that, um, especially when you have the military that is aware uh, of the situation. I mean, you take a look at the, the current situation in Iran, it's not very stable, not very stable in Iran. The, every, every now and then a military leader gets replaced and, and, and shifted to another place because uh, there could be a military coup in Iran. All what it needs is for the few military leaders to be convinced that the government will collapse unless there's a coup. And um, again, we call on to those, uh, you know, the 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 military commanders that have some sense of consciousness left, who have some humanity in them, to side with the people instead of shooting at the people. And we saw in the uprisings, many police officers put down their weapons in support of the of the regime. Again, you know, it's not it's not about uh, removing the regime alone. It's also what comes after that, because who's going to come after that? There are many extremist groups that want to have. Uh, something to do with the, the, the future Iranian government, one of them being the MEK, Mujahideen al Khalq. Uh, they're not uh, <laughs> a peaceful group at all. Um, and I, I just think that we, we need to apply strategy when dealing with Iran, uh, the regime uh, in the West.